And let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But before we get started, let's pray. Uh, Father, again, we come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord, and just lift up as we uh, get into your word here this morning. Pray for my voice, Lord, uh, just that I might speak your word with clarity this morning, Lord, and there would be uh, no distractions or interruptions there, Lord. So we thank you for that, Lord, and again, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians. Chapter 5, short chapter, we're going to be looking at the whole chapter, but um, some important things here. I'm going to go ahead and read this, and then we'll go back and look at it. Um, as it says here, as Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and again, Corinthians being that church that's um, really a church struggling with the world. And so he writes to them there, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that uh, he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of of our Lord Jesus Christ, delivers such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump, the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean the sexual, sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are on the outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Now, there it's safe to say a large portion of the church today that does not have a biblical view of sin. It's not uncommon to hear of people within the church who would identify themselves as believers that are living together without being married and are still welcomed within a church body. After all, aren't we being told by the media that marriage is an obsolete institution? Have you ever 
thought of why they're saying such things? You know, what's their goal? What's their objective? You know, what's behind it all? But as we study this passage here, we're going to get some important biblical insight into this whole area, this whole issue of sin and dealing with sin and how we deal with it, how we are to deal with it as the body of Christ. Because, as I said, there's many even well-known people within the church who do not have a biblical perspective on sin, especially original sin. The fact that, that you know, why, why is sin an issue? Sin's an issue because Adam originally, Adam and Eve originally sinned. And because of that, we're sinners. And that sin has to be dealt with. And it was dealt with by God sending his son to die for our sins on the cross, that we could have eternal life, that we could enter into a relationship with him because he's so holy and righteous, he can't tolerate sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. And for us in the church today to say, hey, these things that Jesus died for, for us to be delivered from, for us to be forgiven for, no big deal. It's like, wait a second here. Where's our heart? You know, where's our attitude in here? So as we pick up here, we're going to see the importance of dealing with immorality within the church. And first of all, we see in verses 1 through 6, that there is a problem with immorality in the church. I mean, face the, we need to face the facts. And as a church, we need to have the right attitude towards sin, we see in the first two verses here. It's, as he says here, it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Well, that word at the translation there isn't real great. It's actually more like it was, it's commonly known, not only in the church, but also in the people other among the non-Christians in Corinth, that there was sexual immorality within the church. Now, in having this conversation, this discussion, it's important to define what we're talking about by sexual immorality. <clears throat> sexual immorality is defined as any sexual relationship of any kind outside of the bonds of the marriage between, and I have to say it this way these days, one biological male and one biological female. Anything up beyond that, outside of that, is sexual immorality. Now, according to a Pew Research study from 2020, half of U.S. Christians say that casual sex between consenting adults is sometimes or always acceptable. I don't know what Bible they're reading. See, this is the problem when we're dealing with the issue of, of sin in the church and having a, a right understanding, a right perspective, a biblical perspective on sin. Because if we don't, then we're looking to the world for our standards of what's right and wrong, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And really, that's what we see taking place in the church today, though the world is looking, or the church is looking to the world rather than being an example to the, to the world. Now, in this situation with Corinth, it was especially, you know, it stood out especially because Corinthians as a whole had, you know, a real bad reputation in, you know, in the Roman Empire. In fact, they coined a word, 
which meant to live like a Corinthian. It was uh, because they lived such debauched lives in Corinth, they made up this word. It's Corinthiazomai in Greek, which means just simply to live like a Corinthian. So when they saw somebody that was really wild, lived a really outlandish life, they said, man, you're living like a Corinthian. And here we have in the church now, there is the folks that Paul's saying to them, guys, you're living in a way even the pagans there in Corinthians and Corinth won't live. The, you're doing something that even they won't do. And instead of mourning about this sin, they were in a settled state of pride in tolerance of it. They thought, you know, this is okay. They, were, they had a progressive attitude towards it. What we would say today, a progressive attitude or a woke attitude toward it, accepting the world standard there and saying, and even going beyond the world standard. We have the situation today within the Southern Baptist Church. They come out with statements on critical race theory and the LBGTQ issues that aren't consistent with the scripture but are more in line with what the world is saying. And there's real division among that denomination now because of it. You see, the Corinthians had ruined their witness and the church had become powerless and ineffective because of it. That's always the result of compromise. The church will become powerless and ineffective. And in fact, in Ephesians 4.30, it tells us that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's what we do when we permit, we allow uh, open sin in the church. We grieve the Holy Spirit. We also, um, you know, the Holy Spirit's also quenched. It was what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. <coughs> and we see it even gets to the point like it did with Samson in Judges 16, 20, where the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. We don't want to be in that place, that condition. And that which is, can be true of the church can also be true of an individual believer. And the question has to be for us individually. Do you tolerate, do I tolerate sin among Christian friends or even myself because we don't want to appear unloving. You know, this is where the kind of the world creeps in there. Oh, it wouldn't be unloving. It would be unloving to um, confront them over this issue. I can't do that. But as he'd say, he's, as he tells them here, you should be rather be mourning over the consequences, the result of that sin is going to have in these people's lives. In fact, in verses 3 through 5, he says, sin in the church needs to be judged. Paul steps into his uh, apostolic authority here and judges the situation. Now, every time you speak, talk about issues like this and, and dealing with sin, what's the first thing you hear? Somebody will pull up Matthew 7, 1 through 5, judge not lest you be judged. And they'll use that as the, as the, you know, as a weapon to say, you can never say anything about anything because you're judging. Now, the point there is that we're not to judge hypocritically. That was the issue. Not to judge hypocritically, not to judge by some standard we don't hold ourselves to. But as 
Jesus said in John 7, 24, but we're to judge righteous judgment. To judge righteous judgment. Only judge someone in the way that you're willing to be judged. Paul had asked them before in chapter 4, verse 21, if they wanted him to come to them with a rod or love and a spirit of gentleness. Well, he's just making it clear to them right up front here, you know, what's required, what's necessary here, what has to be dealt with. You see, power is demonstrated by the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit when we're in sync with him and his will and what he's doing. And he's going to be, you know, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? As we read in John, the Holy Spirit is sent to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so, he's bringing, he will bring these issues to light so that they can be dealt with so people can live, you know, as Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief doesn't come but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's the issue. That's the issue there. Him desiring for us to have an abundant life in him, to be growing in him, to be, be salt and light in this world. You see, this man that they're referring to here within the congregation there in Corinth had let his flesh, his old nature, dominate his life. So Paul, wanted to, he wanted to take this, what sounds like might be an extreme statement, Turn him over to Satan. Whoa, what in the world does he mean by that? Turn him over to Satan that he learned not to blaspheme. When he talks about that, and what he's, what he's saying there is what happens is to say, remove the protection of being in the church. Here's, here's how it goes. If somebody, if you allow him to stay within the church and continue to live his life inconsistently with the faith that he claims, then he thinks everything's okay. They thinks, oh, I'm cool. This must be acceptable. I'm good. There, nobody's saying anything. So it must be okay. So what Paul is saying to do is to let them know this is a serious issue. So basically tell them that you you know he's not permitted in the fellowship in good standing until you repent to, until you deal with this sin. That's what it means to leave him, let him out there, leave him out there in the world to let him see the consequences of his actions, the consequences <coughs> of allowing his life to be dominated in this way, to be focused on the flesh there. You don't want him to feel a false sense of security. And you certainly don't want to be enabling someone in living a sinful life, something that's going to destroy them ultimately. Now, in verse 6, Paul says, if you don't judge this sin, it will result in corruption. Now, the Corinthians would have considered themselves progressive Christians in this sense, um, in, allowing, um, in allowing this type of behavior. But Paul tells them that there is nothing good in the fact 
that they're boasting about their acceptance of sin. There's nothing good in it. That you're glorying in this is not good. Um, the scripture tells us, especially in Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, if you're going to glory in anything, you glory in the Lord. You don't glory in how accepting you are of standards that aren't of the Lord. <coughs> now, the reason that it's not good to glory is because they're not seeing the problem. As he says here, using the illustration of leaven, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Oh, that's, you know, and that kind of became a figure of speech, but here's kind of how it works. You have to remember, there's, they kind of make kind of a distinction here. The kind of distinction is made in the difference between least, ye, least, yeast and leaven, or the least of the leaven or whatever. Uh, yeast and leaven, where the word's the same, but there's a kind of a connotative difference in that, yeah, you use yeast for bread, but he uses the illustration, he goes into uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what they would do is at the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they had to take all the yeast out of their houses. And so that for seven days, they couldn't deal, they only ate unleavened bread. After that, they, re, they again brought yeast in. But what they would do throughout the year, they wouldn't do fresh yeast every time they would use a starter. And they would continue to use that same starter. And so that it got to the point, and this is part of the reason for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is to get out the old leaven, that it gets to the point where it gets so sour and putrefying, then you get other impurities in there and you have... And it causes corruption. You don't want to keep doing that. So he's saying, clean out the old. You know, deal with this. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. And of course, in general, leaven is used in the scripture as a type or an analogy of sin. Because it has the same effect. And that's what he's saying in the congregation here. You allow this to take place excuse me, in the church, it's not going to stop there. There's going to be more. What, what's the next issue? What's the next sin that's going to come up? And you say, well, we, we accepted this guy and we let it go. So we don't really have a right to say anything in this situation. And it, like leaven, will continue to permeate the church and cause putrefaction. You just can't accept it. You can't receive it. You put a small amount of yeast in and it permeates the entire lump of dough. Now the question, and we have to bring this back personally, is... Do you, do I, have a pet sin in our lives that we refuse to deal with? Something that we've just kind of said, oh, it's not that bad. Know that any time we tolerate or condone sin within our own lives as well, that it's going to have the same effect as yeast. It'll eventually permeate and corrupt the whole lump, the whole life. Now, in verses 7 through 8 here, we see that we're called to live, that Christians are called to live different than the world. <clears throat> 
Because you're new creatures in Christ, it's, uh, he basically tells us here in the beginning of verse 7. He gives the Corinthians now a command, a prescription for dealing with the leaven that they had allowed to infect the fellowship. They were to clean out the old leaven that was having this putrefying effect on the church. They could only, again, they could only keep the leaven for so long until it naturally, before it became putrefying. But Paul is telling this compromising church that they need to live according to who they are in Christ. Remember in chapter 1, verse 2, when in his introduction, Paul, you know, introduces himself, Paul, you know, apostle and bondservant of Jesus Christ. And then he addresses the Corinthians, you who are called saints. And that was the import, that's the important thing about why he entered, he introduced himself and how he referred to him. It's in, because within this letter, what he's telling them to do is you need to live according to who you are. As a believer, as someone who says they're really trusting in Christ, really living for the Lord, if you're saying that, do it. Do it. Live according to who you are. I love the picture that we have with Joseph in the Old Testament when he's being, you know, Potiphar's wife is trying to seduce him. And he says to her, how can one such as I do such a thing? And that's it. How can I, as a child of God, a representative of Jesus Christ, how can I behave in such a way that's going to bring disrepute to his name? I mean, how much does the world today look down on the church because of the hypocrisy that they see within it? Now, it's yes, often used as an excuse, but at the same time, don't give any excuses. We shouldn't be giving him them anything to use as an excuse. Paul was saying his well here that for, you know, the Israelites... When he's saying purge out the old lump, he's, the Israelites, the feast of unleavened bread was a picture of the separation and redemption of God's people from Egypt. In Egypt, if you look at history typically or, you know, the analogy that we're often given in Scripture is Egypt was a type of the old life of sin. And they were called out to be separate. In that way, there weren't to be, you know, and you've probably heard the description, you know, talking about Israel in the wilderness and the struggle they had. There is, you know, they took them out of Egypt, but it took 40 years for them, for God to take Egypt out of them. So the question comes, is there something in your life, in my life, that's not consistent with who you are as a believer? What are you doing to remove it as they removed the leaven? In fact, in 1 John 1, 9, of course, it tells us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in second part of verse 7 here, he tells them as well that we're to know the basis for your changed life. As it says here, since you truly are unleavened, the reason for living holy lives is 
is the price that was paid to give us those lives. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11, particularly, Paul's dealing with the question, the issue with the Romans. You know, should we continue to sin that grace should abound? Say, you've been delivered from it. Why should you live in it any longer? Sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you're not under the law but under grace. We're to be holy as our heavenly father is holy. We're told in Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, Leviticus 19, 2 and 27 and 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. It doesn't change. We, you know, it's not just an Old Testament thing. But we should, as believers, be striving to be like our heavenly father and reflecting him in this world. You are set apart for a special purpose. And again, it says in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The calling to which you are called, to which each of us are called, has high standards. They're not standards that we can just meet on our own, but we need to depend on the finished work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But the final answer always to every problem and every sin is the cross. And again, the question, how do we view who we are in Christ? How do we view ourselves in the position of what he's accomplished on our behalf? If Jesus went to this so great an extent for me, how can I do anything else but live for him? How do you act because of who you are? And in verse 8, he tells him specifically to live the differences. He says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Live the different life. Here's the challenge for the believer and for the church. You have a vital part to play in the witness and the effectiveness of the church. Yielding to sin ruins the church. You'll, and another symptom of that is someone who's living a life of sin will find that they lose a hunger for the word. You know, those Two things kind of go hand in hand. You're not, if you're living, if you're condoning sin, in any church as a whole that condones the sin as well, you're going to find that they're downplaying the word as well. Because they can't go together. The church will be paralyzed in its witness, taking away the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit when we condone sin. And there will be a growth of people holding malice toward one another, and there'll be an increase in the amount of types of wickedness allowed. <clears throat> 
The challenge is to live the life of a believer, not after the flesh, but after the Lord. Now, in the rest of this chapter, this section here, it tells him to deal directly with the immoral believer. And this is incredibly practical and gives us insight into what we're called to do. Uh, he says, first of all, don't keep company with immoral people in the church. Those who claim to be believers and are living lives that are clearly immoral, he says, don't associate with them. Now, it seems as though from what Paul is saying here that there was some confusion about a statement that Paul made in his previous letter about not associating with immoral people. Those who are puffed up that he refers to, those who are being prideful, may have used it to try to say that the instructions of Paul were ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. You know, how do you get away from people that are immoral? Because there's immoral people, immoral people all over the place. And this is the way that the whole idea of church discipline looks to many people, even within the church today, is it's, you know, ridiculous. There's so much stuff out there. How do you, you know, how do you live with it? How do you deal with it? In this, there's a failure to see the uniqueness of the calling of the church. What they were to do was to make it perfectly clear that such behavior is inconsistent with the Christian life. Now, the question comes up, well, what does this mean? What do we do? You know, to be honest, it would be much better overall. And Paul is really in a sense, referring back to this um, Matthew chapter 18, especially, you know, where he talks about if a brother sins against you, Jesus talks about if your brother sins against you, you know, you go to that brother yourself. And then if he won't hear you, then take one another with you. And then um, if they won't hear you, then take it to the church and then let him as Jesus said, be treated basically as an unbeliever. It's much better. It's much better if this sort of discipline is done on a personal level. Not making it a large blown up thing, but to simply say, if you know someone specifically here as he's dealing with sexual immorality, if you know someone in your circle of friends who, whatever, who's purporting to be a believer and is living in sexual immorality, you should go to them and say simply, you know, this is inconsistent with what you're, you're professing to be. It's not okay. That's the main thing right there is to say, this is not Okay. You're living inconsistently with what you're saying. You're ruining your witness. You're ruining the witness of the church. You're being a hypocrite. And Paul takes this even beyond the area of sexual immorality. Excuse me. In um, that it was intended for any behavior that was inconsistent with a follower of Christ. 
as he, he says there, <clears throat> to, not to keep company with the sexually immoral, immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or, or, an extent, or an extortioner, anyone who's living inconsistently with the Christian life, with their profession. You know, we have to ask ourselves the question, what does your life, what does my life tell others about who Jesus is and what he did for us? How's my life a demonstration of that? And then we see, as he makes the statement here specifically, that we're, because the question was um, about, you know, the, the question was, the confusion was over, you know, how do you get away from immoral people? Well, as he says here, you know, he wasn't talking about the immoral people of the world because if you wanted to get away from immoral people in the world, you'd have to leave, leave the world because it's full of immoral people. And, that's, and so that's not the issue there. But he says there in verses 12 in the beginning of 13 that God will judge the world. The judgment of the world is something that we're not to be a part of at this time. But we'll see in chapter 6 that later we will be a part of the final judgment, but it's not, a part, it's not part of our job now to go around judging everybody in the world. You know, because it gets kind of ridiculous. Of, of course, you know, non-believers live like non-believers. And we can rail on it, we can talk about it, we can do you know, all of those things, but not really accomplish anything. But in the midst of it, our responsibility is, as Jesus said in Matthew um, 5, verses 13 through 16, we're to be salt and light in the midst of it. That's our responsibility. That's the conviction that we're to give at this time, and we're to live consistently with that so that we will be salt and light. That's the type of judgment to, we're, to be involved in. We can't expect pagans to act like Christians. But take every opportunity to show them the way. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But his final statement, Paul's final statement here is to put out those who continue to sin. Now, there's two reasons to deal with sin in the church. The first is to maintain the purity of the church so it can be a witness. The second reason is for the benefit and the salvation of the person who's sinning. Church discipline is a way to separate the real believer from the fake. No true believer can continue in a life of sin and be happy in it. 1 John 3, 4 through 6 tells us that, you know, if anyone knows God, that he doesn't make a practice Continual practice of sin. If you, through discipline, remove them from the church and that does not cause them to repent, that's a strong indication that they weren't saved in the first place. You see, what we're doing, when, what he's cause, calling them to do here is to remove the confusion. 
What's it mean to be, follow Jesus? You know, you just can't take the Jesus name tag and live like you want and think everything's going to be okay. But we're being saved from something as well as to something. We're saved from our sin and the destruction that it's causing. And we're being saved to a life, eternal life in him, which is a quality of life, not just a duration of life. It's a quality of life that we live as believers. Why do we live differently? Because we have eternal life now. Because Jesus paid the price, purchased for us eternal life so that now I want to live a life that's consistent with who I am in him. The church is to be the place where sheep are fed we're not here to give comfort to goats. We can't because we'd be, we would be self-deceptive and we'd be deceived giving them false comfort. So we need to recognize that the church isn't perfect, but not glory in the imperfection. You know, of course there's problems within the church. Of course there's sin within the church. There's people. We need to realize, though, that we're called to be different. And because we're called to be different, we're also called to deal with with immoral behavior or behavior that's not consistent with who we are in Christ. That's part of what it means to be the church. Now, this is one of those passages. This, to be honest, is why we teach verse by verse through the Scripture. The reason we teach verse by verse through the Scripture is so we can't avoid stuff like this. Because if it was a part of, you know, if it was a decision of personal preference, you'd come to this chapter and look, ooh, I'll stay away from that one. Let me go to something that's more comfortable and more, quote, unquote, edifying or, you know, sounds better. But this is who we are. This is who we are in Christ, who we're called to be. A unique people, a people called out of this world to walk in light. And part of being a church, part of being a fellowship together is this, yes, this mutual accountability, mutual encouragement, all of those things playing together that we might really be salt and light, that we might really be a testimony. And how it, people would come to know Jesus. But if we don't live any differently, they won't see the reason for that. We each have a place in this. Like I said, it's, it's just much better if it's done on a personal level. But no that God will work. God will use it. We always think the worst of things like this. We think like, you know, if I, you know, if I confront them over this issue, they'll take off, they'll run. But what if they don't? What if they say, you're right? And then they start to live a dynamic Christian life because you've shared with them and they saw, they got a realization of what the word actually says. God will work. God will use it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for your word, for your grace, your love. 
Lord, even in these difficult issues, these challenging places in the scripture that, you know, you call us to be who you called us to be, your people. So, Lord, we just pray that you take this, this, apply it here, Lord, to our hearts. Um, may us, we first examine ourselves. And if there's any area in our lives that's inconsistent with our profession, Lord, you had shed your light on it and we could confess and repent, Lord. But Lord, as well, use us to encourage and challenge those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.